It has webbed feet like a frog, a bill like a duck, and venom like a snake. And oddest of all, it lays eggs like a bird. So much of its life is spent underwater or underground that the life of the platypus is still largely unknown. An irresistible challenge to filmmaker David Perra. I've always been fascinated by the mysteries of how platypus have their young. And over the next three years, we're going to take you on a journey to discover what happens deep inside their nesting burrows. It's a truly amazing story. Maybe she's active. By tracking its daily life, researchers will help Pera reveal the most intimate moments in the life of what is surely the strangest animal on Earth. The high plateau of Tasmania, the southernmost link in a mountain chain that stretches the whole length of Australia's eastern coast. When the winter blizzards blow in from the Southern Ocean, life here gets tough. Yet, even here, the platypus thrives. Its thick fur provides near-perfect insulation as it forages for a sparse living in the frozen tarns. The spring thaw turns mountain streams into torrents. Humans are rare in the remote Tasmanian wilderness but platypuses are plentiful. There's prey to catch with their probing bills under every rock. Shrimps and worms and the larvae of aquatic insects. I've looked for a platypus up and down the east coast of Australia, but the wild rivers of Tasmania are the greatest place to find them. But even here, they're difficult to see. They seem to meld into the water and rocks and then suddenly disappear. When Europeans first encountered it, the platypus seemed almost too weird to be real. The name comes from the Greek for flat-footed, Yet it was the creature's duck bill that most fascinated 19th century zoologists. Two hundred years on, we're just beginning to understand what a remarkable instrument it is. In fact, there's a lot about this secretive animal that we're only finding out now. As the early naturalists discovered, the platypus is not an easy animal to study, its burrows may run back into the banks for 30 metres. And they soon learned to be cautious. They found that the venomous spur of an angry male caused pain and swelling that lasted for weeks. So it wasn't until the 1880s that scientists confirmed that the platypus really did lay eggs. By the early 1900s, they were learning how to keep platypuses alive in captivity. In 1944, naturalist David Flay successfully bred from a captive pair called Jack and Jill. Months ago, David Flay noticed Jill was building a nest. He knew she was building up her milk supply. He then dug down and uncovered the burrow. To his delight, he found a youngster already well grown. But this would be the only platypus born in captivity for 50 years. And even today, little is known about how they breed in the wild. A quiet valley in northern Tasmania, in the headwaters of the South Esk River.
An unassuming farm dam proves an ideal site for biologist Nina Koch. She needs to trap a female platypus, the first step in an ambitious project. It's really unbelievable that these farm dams can be such a good place for platypus to live in. They seem to be enormously productive, ideal habitat for females to breed in. I heard about Nina's work in Tasmania and came over to join her. Perhaps she may be able to help us in our quest to find breeding platypus. Nina has been fascinated by the platypus ever since she saw one on TV as a child. Now she's come all the way from Germany to take part in a two-year study. The aim? To find out more about how female platypuses raise their young. First, Nina measures the platypus's exact dimensions. The tiny craters in her leathery bill are receptors. Some are sensitive to touch, others to the minute electrical impulses emitted by her prey. Just keep on. Probably old enough, not healthy enough. Next, Nina attaches a tiny radio transmitter to the platypus's fur. It needs to be tested thoroughly before next year's full scale breeding study. Nina decides to call the female Shy, after a platypus character in a children's book. Within days, Nina has identified the precise location of one of Shai's sleeping burrows on an island in the dam. We've tracked Shai for a couple of days now, and we could follow her to this island. And she's sleeping right here in her burrow, and we are going to put an infrared video camera in so we can see what she's doing in her burrow. Just before dawn, Shai returns to sleep. For Nina and her partner, Marcus Utesh, this is the first view of a platypus underground. There she is. She's coming in. Next year, they'll try to get a camera inside the burrow of a breeding platypus. That is absolutely great. Wow. A few weeks later, Nina and Marcus find a baby platypus near the dam. It's only just emerged from the nest. Soon after, they find another, bigger youngster. This baby looked much more like an adult. It weighs 610 grams, so double the size of the one that we caught before. He released his baby in one of the farm dams and then it started immediately to, to feed along the border of the lake. We tried the next day to see it again. I sat on a pontoon and paddled towards the little platypus. He just stopped feeding and suddenly he even came closer to me. He was by far more curious than afraid. Nina is hooked. This will be an ideal location for next year's study. The only other animals on Earth that are even distantly related to the platypus are the echidnas. Like the platypus, the short-beaked echidna has looked much the same since the age of the dinosaurs. It too has evolved a highly specialized mouth, not a bill, but a beak, which can be used as a crowbar if need be, 
and a long sticky tongue to pull ants and termites from deep within their nests. Despite their different lifestyles, the echidna and the platypus share one crucial characteristic. They're the only surviving members of an ancient group of egg-laying mammals, the monotremes. Peggy Rismiller and Mike McKelvey have been tracking and studying echidnas for 15 years. What they've discovered about the echidna's breeding cycle may help David Perra in his pursuit of the platypus. Let's whisper. Up to a dozen echidnas at a time may be carrying transmitters. Okay. It's always worth seeing what Hari's doing. What Hari's doing is looking for a mate. Mostly, echidnas lead solitary lives, but when a female comes on heat, males will gather from far and wide. But the females emit a scent, and the scent is called a pheromone, and it's something that humans often can't smell, but obviously the, the males can smell it. The pheromone, of course, would be able to go cross-country on wind and attract the males, and we've seen males cross this peninsula several times and then eventually end up with a female. Hari and several other males are already here. And Whisper is on his way. Yep, he's there. Whisper joins what's called an echidna train, a group of males all paying court to a single female. OK. She had an old burrow over here. A train can stay in place for up to a week, with the males constantly jockeying for position. They must be patient, but ready for instant action. Mating will take place just once when the female decides that the time and the partner are right. To try to capture the elusive courtship ritual of the platypus, David travels to the far north of Queensland. Here, in the tropical rainforest, the mating season has already begun. This female is feeding hard to ready herself for the rigours of motherhood. Every 40 seconds or so, she must surface to breathe. This is when she's most vulnerable. Eyes and ears are open wide, alert for danger. But as soon as she dives, she shuts them tight. Using only the sensors in her bill, she's built up a detailed mental map of her feeding ground. And she knows its inhabitants too, especially the resident cormorant. The white-faced heron minds its own business. Cormorant mines the platypuses. Each time the platypus dives, the cormorant follows, snapping up shrimp and small fish flushed out by the foraging platypus. And if the platypus rests too long between dives, the cormorant lets her know it. In this particular river system, almost every pool has several resident platypuses and a single cormorant ready to exploit them. The 
other inhabitants of the pool give the platypus no trouble at all. The azure kingfishers are peaceable neighbours too. They may occasionally snap up fish and shrimp she drives to the surface, but at least they don't harass her to dive for them. Most platypuses have a broader home range than a single pool. This muddy tributary to the mainstream is a favourite feeding ground. Platypuses make their way up the creek at all hours of the day and night to feed. They can sense the vibrations of their prey through the receptors in their bills. I've been here for about three months now and been desperately trying to find a place where the platypus are courting. I think we might be onto something here. This is firm flat. It appears to be dominated by a male. And he does his patrolling and again it appears that there's a female. I think it's just coming up to her burrow or area that she spends a lot of time at now. As the light begins to fade, the platypuses start to make their way further up the narrow creek. There's even better feeding where it runs through cleared farmland, but the platypuses will only venture there at night. This is an ideal creek to film platypus with an infrared camera. I really like using infrared cameras because you can capture behaviours at night that no one's ever seen before. We put up a, a red light. The platypus can see the red light but they don't seem to be disturbed by it. Sitting there beside the bank of the river with the water running through my boots and the legs of the tripod in the water, as the animals slowly worked their way up towards me, they would stop and glance up and then keep on coming. They were totally unafraid. In the first hour after dark, six platypus passed me. And then a water rat appeared. Water rats are about the same size as a platypus, but much fiercer. A few nights later, David Perra sets up his infrared equipment on a bridge overlooking the main river. Just below the bridge, a big male platypus has established his home range. But tonight, he has a challenger from further up the river. The resident male is grooming himself on a log, apparently unaware of the intruder. Despite being caught by surprise, the resident male has won the encounter easily. 
he hasn't had to use his most damaging weapon. The poisonous spur on his hind leg is fed by a venom gland that in the breeding season reaches its maximum size. Day and night now, the big male patrols his home range. He spotted another male lurking behind a stump. Without hesitation, he steams into battle. Whether platypuses regularly use their spurs in these encounters, or whether they're weapons of last resort, we don't know. In this case, the resident male is triumphant, and a female is ready to be courted. The male grasps the female's tail, and the courtship dance begins. The dance can continue for 20 minutes or more. Whether the female is courted and mated by many males, or just one, is something else we don't know for sure. Finally, it looks as though the male mounts the female and mating takes place. The bear patch on her tail may be a sign that she's been courted often in recent days. Now she's returning to her nesting burrow. One or two eggs, perhaps even three, are on the way. Hillsville Sanctuary in Southern Australia. Much of what we know about platypus mating and breeding has been learned by Les Fisk and his colleagues from the captive animals at Healesville Sanctuary. For 10 years, a male and female platypus have lived in this elaborate artificial world. Through a maze of tunnels, pipes and tanks, video cameras record their every move. Two years ago, for the first time since David Flay's success in the 1940s, Fisk managed to breed platypuses in captivity. For most of the year, Karina, the female, will have nothing to do with N, the male. But spring is in the air at Hillsville Sanctuary. David Perra has already been manning his remote cameras for two weeks. Today, finally, the preliminaries are over and the serious courtship has begun. The moment that she's ready to mate can be fleeting. N is determined that he's the one who'll be around when that moment comes. But her attempted escape was all part of the ritual. Karina soon returns to the dance.
Two years ago, this couple successfully produced twins. Judging by the way the courtship is consummated, the signs are good for this season too. Summer has come again to Tasmania, and its wild rivers are swollen with melting snow. In a quiet backwater, as temperatures rise and the days lengthen, a female platypus is collecting material for her nest. She takes leaves one by one in her bill and jams them under her tail. To safeguard it from flooding, she's dug the entrance to her burrow several metres up the steep bank. Over the next few days, she'll make dozens of trips like this, until the nesting chamber at the end of her long burrow is lined with sticks and leaves. Back on the South Esk River, Nina Kosh and Marcus Utesh are joined once again by David Perra for the start of a new season's work. In the early afternoon, we go down to the South Esk River and set up a series of nets. These nets were originally designed to catch eels, but they're also really good and safe for catching platypus as well. Yep. They position the nets across the water flow to trap the nightly traffic of platypuses as they feed up and down the river. In the late afternoon, the platypus come out of their burrows and start feeding. They're very good at avoiding nets because their sensitive bill can pick up the water flowing through the mesh. Many evade the nets, but eventually we catch one. Judging by the dates that last year's youngsters emerged from their nesting burrow, Nina and Marcus have worked out that the females will be laying their eggs very soon. Now is the time to fix radio transmitters to them. Whew. This one has a large bear patch on her tail, a sign that she's probably been courted intensively. The tail. Yeah, that one. All the animals. This might be a mating mark. All the fur is away from the tail surface. They discover that she's one of the females they trapped and tagged last year. In fact, it's their old friend, Shy. 8017, that's Shy. Wow. We got Shy back. We come back. Great. After several weeks exhausting work setting nets up and down the river, Nina and Marcus managed to catch seven females. Mm -hmm. 
Each one is fitted with a new transmitter and released back into the river exactly where she was caught. Some feed mostly in daylight, others sleep during the day and feed all night. Some travel a kilometre or more up and down the river each feeding session. Others, including Shai, feed in one pool most of the time. Where's the strongest signal coming from? Um, Bounce or? Nope. She must be sitting in there. Wow. Shai sleeps in the same burrow each day. Nina and Marcus want to pin... Nina and Marcus, it's the start of another period of intense work, tracking all seven females for hours at a time. <laughs> they find there's a wide variation in the platypus's behaviour point its exact location because there's a good chance it's where she's built a nest and is nursing her young. That reception here and it's getting weaker. Which gain do you have? Ten. Gain ten, maximum gain. Gain ten and I only have like one. Hmm. I would say it's about here. It must be around here. Not this point here. It gets weaker here. Yep. But it's exciting. Mm. Get another burrow. Yep. And we should and mark this one the looks entrance. a bit this one looks a bit different than the yeah. others, yeah? We should mark the entrance. To um. Meanwhile, Peggy Rismiller and Mike McKelvey are still keeping track of their echidnas. I think try again from here. Oh yeah. Right, so was that Cyprus? Three weeks ago, this female was at the head of a mating train. She should by now have laid an egg. Okay, I'm just going to feel first. Very tight little pouch. Quite a bit there, Jilla, just be very careful because. Mm. Egg egg an egg. My oh my mm. See if you can get it closer down your way. I'm going to pull the pouch open. Where's there the it egg? is. There's the egg. It's an egg. And there's a girl. Ten days after the egg is laid, a puggle will hatch. In the egg, the echidna develops an enamel-covered egg tooth. It needs this egg tooth to actually rip open this leathery shell and then pull itself out onto the mother's belly. Look, there's the back of it. Inside the pouch, it's really moist and humid because that's what the puggle needs right now. As far as we know, at two grams, it has to breathe through its skin. Tiny though it is, the puggle can safely be removed from its mother's pouch for a minute or so. At two days old, there's almost no difference between a baby echidna and a baby platypus. Less than two weeks later, it's already a hundred times heavier than when it was hatched. It's a girl. The baby echidna by now has a discernible beak, just as a baby platypus would have a recognisable bill. After seven weeks in the pouch, the mother leaves her young one in a burrow, returning every five days or so to let it suckle. Instead of nipples, the mother has specially adapted paws clustered in patches on her tummy. As the baby suckles, the mother expresses the milk through her skin. It doesn't need its eyes. I think it's like all very small animals, they go on scent. And so the young is scenting where the milk patch is. At six months, the young one is almost ready for independence. Back at the South Est River, Marcus and Nina have decided that the time has come to try to take a look inside Shire's nesting burrow. Can I have some radar sign from here?
Shai has been feeding regularly for 16 hours in every 24, returning to the same burrow each day to sleep. They're sure she's nursing young. It's late evening. Shai's already left the burrow to feed. Nina, Marcus and David have at least eight hours to try to get a glimpse inside the nesting chamber. First, Marcus drills a hole carefully into the burrow roof. Frequent measurements over the past two weeks have taught him exactly where and how deep to drill. Meanwhile, David sets up and tests an endoscope with a tiny video camera mounted on its end. So down is like that. Yep. We're straightening it up. Mm -hmm. It was really exciting going down into the nest chamber for the first time. Those are roots coming down into the top and then we saw the entrance to the chamber itself. And the nest was a really complex structure. It was tightly woven leaves wrapped around with sticks and roots. And there was even some green plastic in amongst the leaves. Yeah, that's the root there. Okay. But that's when our frustrations really began. Over a period of 17 days, we went in six times into the burrow, but we just couldn't penetrate the nest. And then at last, we got the endoscope through the nest wall. We first glimpsed a tiny bit of flesh through the leaves. And then another period of frustration, half an hour trying to get a glimpse of the bill. Oh, it's a bloody horse. Yes. The bill looked huge through the endoscope, but it was really only a centimetre long. The front feet already had claws. And then, to our amazement, we saw there were two babies, not one, crammed into the tiny nest. Thank you. Three weeks later, we went into the burrow again, and we found them immediately. It's incredible. They'd grown enormously. Now they were covered in a thin layer of fur. There are even visitors inside the burrow. What is that? It's a tick. I think it was a tick. The ticks are only found on platypus, and already they're feeding on the blood of the young ones. Their bills are now large and very dark. We think the young are now about six or seven weeks old. We're eager to see how the various parts of their body have developed. Their front feet have webbing between the toes. And on their back foot is the beginnings of a spur. The smaller one is female. The larger one has a much bigger spur. It's obviously a male. We called him Bigfoot. The nostrils are huge. We think they're probably used to find the milk patches of the mother. And here, the smaller one is rubbing the tummy of the larger one, as if it's trying to suckle. It was a revealing three hours in the burrow. Nina is spending hours each day by the riverbank recording Shai's feeding patterns.
It's late summer on the South Esk, and vast numbers of insects are hatching from the river. It's an ideal time for Shai to be feeding her young. She's just feeding enormously. She spends 16 hours out in the river and she just goes along the river and wherever she is just feeds. Unbelievable hungry little female. A nursing platypus will consume up to half her body weight in food every 24 hours. Most of it consists of tiny morsels, which she must somehow find and separate from the leaves, mud or gravel on the riverbed. When she gets to the surface, she chews with a sideways motion of her grinding pads, separating out and swallowing the food. In a single feeding session, she may dive up to a thousand times. Tonight, the team plan to go into Shire's burrow once again. So while Nina tracks Shy to make sure she's out feeding, the team drills a new hole into her nesting chamber. This time, they're installing a tiny remote controlled camera that will be able to film Shy feeding her young without disturbing her. Illumination comes from miniature infrared lights, which she can't see. And as well as the camera, there's a microphone to pick up sound inside the burrow. That's the big one. There, oh. The babies are now about 13 weeks old. Their eyes are open, their bills are fully formed, and their coats have grown thick. While Bigfoot plays with tree roots in the roof of the chamber, the smaller one is perhaps getting ready to take on solid food. Nina warns that Shy is on her way back to the burrow. As she approaches the nesting chamber, she unblocks the earthen plugs which she set there to protect her young. Then she's through into the chamber. Here we go. Within minutes, the eager young are greedily suckling from their mother's milk patches. But the team is about to see behaviour that no one has ever seen before. That is amazing. The young stopped suckling and then began to rub their mother's bill. Are they taking food from her? Perhaps getting a taste of those little animals that they themselves will be eating in the next few weeks? Or are they drinking her saliva? 
may be getting some of the bacteria that will strengthen their immune system. We don't really know what we're seeing in these extraordinary pictures. Soon, Shire's had enough. She busily rebuilds the nest around her young. And then she's gone, leaving a tangle of tails and bills behind her. Ten days later, on watch as usual beside Shai's pool, Marcus and Nina spot one of the young platypuses in the water. Bigfoot, the male, has emerged from the nest. The team watches, enthralled, as the last chapter in the drama they've been following for months unfolds. Bigfoot needs no tuition from his mother. Minutes after his emergence, he's swimming and foraging expertly along the bank. He asserts his independence swiftly. Within a few weeks, he's travelling well upstream from his mother's pool. Soon, he'll have to leave this rich feeding ground. He's trespassing on the home range of older, larger males. As Bigfoot begins his journey of life, our journey of discovery is coming to an end. We know nothing of what he does in the next couple of years. In fact, I feel that we've only just scratched the surface in understanding the platypus, one of the most mysterious animals on Earth. They move among us, but have powers we can scarcely imagine. One fools by camouflage. We got some great footage. One uses electricity as a lethal weapon. That's not a trick. <laughs> and one regrows its organs. Seeing is believing. Three supreme survivors. Oh yes. To understand how these animals work. We've built detailed virtual models of their bodies using the latest scientific data. With them, we'll venture deep inside these creatures to find out what gives them their extraordinary powers. Join me as we embark on a quest to unravel the mysteries behind animal superpowers. There are creatures on this planet 
that have evolved incredible powers of survival. These animals use a bewildering array of... In This cement tower houses the entrance to the deepest working mine on the planet, a complex megastructure where the earth is the enemy and gold is the prize. It is a mining matrix built over 3.6 kilometers or 2.2 miles underground, a place called Tau Tona, city of inches would certainly hold little appeal. Humans have always been fascinated by the idea of getting closer to the stars, but going underground has never had the same attraction. Gold, as it happens, is a critical component in space technology. It seems that even reaching for the stars requires the Midas touch. For miners at Tautona, gold is simply a commodity. But for most people, solid gold is the thing of fairy tales. It is associated with riches and glamour, the athlete's ultimate prize. Only a tiny percentage of an Olympic gold medal is actually gold, and yet it takes around half a ton of ore to produce the six grams of gold in just one of the prized medals, and more than one ton of rock to create a solid gold wedding band. Small wonder that going for gold means so much. There's so many things against success. But yet, the human spirit is the one thing that pulls this mining industry through, and especially the people of this mine. The engineers and scientists who created the Great Lion have won a race of their own. Their prize has become an engineering landmark. Tau Tona is a mighty megastructure with a great history and a rich future. A city of gold where men push the boundaries of science and continue to fearlessly challenge nature itself.